Christine Lagarde is the head of the European Central Bank right now, and she's taking the ECB out of their comfort zone, at least according to a recent headline by The Economist. And indeed she is. She's recently said that stable coins pose serious risks. She's warned against vaccine optimism. She said users cannot rely on crypto assets maintaining a stable value because they're volatile, speculative, and not, do not fulfill all the functions of money. But perhaps most interest, interestingly for our discussion, she said, quote, the European Central Bank can neither go bankrupt nor run out of money, even if it were to suffer losses on the multi-trillion euro pile of bonds bought under its stimulus programs. And that's where we're going to turn to, the multi-trillion euro bond stimulus, question mark? Yeah, and that's, again, it's one of those technically true, but ultimately, is it meaningless or is it misleading? I mean, it's not exactly what she's stating. And that's true. I mean, look, if the, if the, if, uh, if the ECB, like the Federal Reserve or any central bank, loses on you know, the prices that pay and credit risk and defaults and these kinds of things and the bonds and the assets that it owns, it's absolutely true. The central bank doesn't go out of business. But the, what, does it actually print money for those bonds or does it just create its own liabilities, unlike some other real world businesses, but not unlike real world banks who have the same sort of capacities to create their own liabilities at times under certain conditions, but they actually do create and, and uh, do uh, that's what actually creates the money in the monetary system. So the central bank in some ways is kind of like that, except what it creates as a liability to offset its losses may not be as useful and as meaningful as she projects it to be. Part one, part two, and part three, I think there's going to be a theme of technically true, but violating the spirit and implicit assumptions that we all make based on our regular day-to-day -day lives. Let's get back to here to part two. So the article in question is, Saving Jobs Won't Save Us From Jaws. That was posted at Alhambra Investments blog on December 1st. But we don't want to start out talking about December 1st. We want to talk about September of 2019, Jeff, which I nominate as the worst month for central bankers in 10 years. Why? Well, in the United States, we had the whole repurchase agreement market seize up. And the repurchase agreement market is where banks get their short-term funding. That put egg on the faces of the Federal Reserve, and we were not going to get into it. But that same month, something happened across the pond in Atlantic, in, across, across that body of water between America and, and Europe. I don't know what it's called these days, anyhow. Jeff, what happened in Europe in September of 2019? Well, Europe had been on this, again, like Jay Powell in the U.S., Europe had been prior on this uh, projecting that the economy was going to accelerate into recovery. There'd be inflation. Mario Draghi, who had been Christine Lagarde's successor, was going to walk off into the sunset, ending QE and having this, his big parade and retirement celebrations all full of economic completion. We made it. We finally got a recovery long last. Well, September 2019 rolls around, and it was obvious by then, again, data-driven bond market signals, not DSGE models. It was obvious by September 2019 that things were going really awry, especially in Europe. Europe, probably more than any place else, had been the epicenter of this euro dollar number four disruption, which left it, on the, if not on the precipice, maybe on the precipice of recession, but in some, some accounts and in some countries, it was already in recession by September of 2019. And so, Mario Draghi, rather than ending his tenure on a you know, success story, winding down QE, taking the ECB, you know, taking a step back with the ECB and letting the economy take over as it was supposed to, instead they restarted QE in 2019. So his last act leading into Christine Lagarde's first, uh, first initial days of tenure was to rerun QE all over again. Which, of course, was super embarrassing and a complete policy 180. They, they were not expecting to do this, at least publicly. And since then, they have, as these quotes that I uh, cited earlier, they have printed a lot of money, Jeff, a lot. And they've got so many of these programs. And you, you reference a few of them. And I just want to talk about them just for a second, just so people understand, because I think most of our audience is in the United States, so they're familiar with QE. 
But in Europe, they're called by a different name, but they might just be the same thing. So there's this current account of 2.91 trillion euros. What's in the current account versus what is in the deposit account, which is only 0.59 trillion euros? Well, it's really a distinction without a difference, except that the, uh, the way the ECB controls interest rates or believes it controls short-term money rates in Europe, uh, it uses a corridor approach. And so the deposit account is a special account that banks can use and access for uh, reserves that uh, in, in prior periods actually paid out an interest rate. So that was basically their IOER type of deal. But ever since 2014, of course, the deposit account has been set at a negative interest rate, which is supposed to disincentivize banks from using it. Yet, as we've seen since 2014 and the arrival of negative interest rates, banks don't really care. They'll pay the penalty to hold the most liquid assets anyway, because for as far as a bank is concerned, bank reserves are nothing more than a, an asset choice for their balance sheet and a liquid asset choice that doesn't come with all sorts of risks and perils that might be attached with riskier forms of credit and lending. So what the banking system has done in the deposit account is say, look, we're just going to hold reserves with the ECB. It doesn't matter what they penalize us. We're just going to do that. And the current account is simply, you know, sort of the same byproduct of bank reserves as in the Federal Reserve set up. It's what, you know, when the, when the ECB buys a security from, a, from a, a money dealer in Europe, it swaps that asset for these reserves that go into the current account. So it's really together the deposit account and the current account are a form of bank reserves in the European system. And so we could call that QE just under different names. Is that right? Yeah, QE is really, it's, it's large-scale asset purchases. That's really what QE is. And lar you know, large-scale asset purchases just, just means the central bank is going to expand its balance sheet by purchasing assets because that's how a central bank does expand its balance sheet. And by purchasing assets, the remainder on the central bank's liability side, which we just talked about, are these bank reserves. So as long as those, observe, those reserves aren't sterilized or absorbed in some other fashion, usually by a, a government action, then what's left over is these excess reserves go into the banking system books. But the banking system doesn't use them or view them as money. They're simply just another form of asset to hold. And in this case, they're very liquid and, and uh, un, you know, le, uh, low risk, risk-free assets. So that's how they're being used in these situations. And again, as we just said, to leave their money in the deposit account or to leave the res these reserves in the deposit account, even though it's, they're being charged 40 basis points at the lowest tier. I like that name, large scale asset purchase program. That makes more sense than quantitative easing. And so we've got about two. Yeah, but right. I mean, it doesn't convey the, ter what the, you know, the term quantitative easing is supposed to convey a specific meaning. Quantitative easing. It's supposed to convey money printing. That's the easing. And then quantitative is, again, Janet Yellen, data-driven, science, it's, it's mathematics. We're, 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 we've figured out ahead of time the exact right amount of easing in order to achieve our goals. So it's, you know, LSAP or a large-scale asset purchase, that's technically what happens. But again, we're, we're misleading by using the term quantitative easing because as we know throughout history, throughout any place this stuff is tried, it obviously can't have been quantitative, right? If you have to do it more than once, it wasn't the right quantity, right? That's, I mean, that's simple stuff. And then once you realize it's not the right quantity, you start asking questions, well, is this actually easing? Are bank reserves actually money? Is this really nothing more than an asset swap? And so, you know, quantitative easing, LSAPs, these are not really the same thing, but these economists like to be tricky about how they perceive or how they portray what they're doing as well as the results of what they're doing. And so, but it seems like that's pretty targeted. They're not just going out there willy nilly and just buying anything they see. They've, they've got a corporate sector purchase program, a public sector purchase program, asset backed sector securities purchase program, third covered bonds. And then recently they've started kind of similar, uh, of the, uh, the corona purchases, the pandemic emergency purchases. Yeah, so, exactly. So it seems targeted. It seems like they are... No, see, to me, it's not. I mean, look, I mean, the fact that yeah. you first you covered bond purchase program number three, right? Right, <laughs> yeah, not, I didn't mention that part, one. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a scattershot approach, and that's really... It, mm -hmm. And again, that's why they hide this stuff and, and just call it quantitative easing, because quantitative easing is what they want the public to think of it. 
when you look at all these individual programs and how they actually uh, conduct the purchases, it's a shotgun approach. It's not a, it's not quiet, quantitative at all. It's not scientific at all. It's not data driven at all. They're basically just throwing crap against the wall and hoping something sticks. That's the opposite of the, the, the message they're trying to portray. And that's really the common thread in all of these things is that they don't really know what the hell they're doing. They're just doing a bunch of stuff and hoping people believe in it. And that's why it never works. As you pointed out, Emil, this year, the ECB, like every other central bank, has been extremely busy. Busy in a way it has never been busy before. The PEPP, in addition to the PSPP, these two different QEs that are running simultaneously, have. I mean, the, the amount of bank reserves in Europe have gone through the roof. I think combined the deposit and uh, the deposit and the current account are somewhere close to three and a half trillion, mm -hmm. which is an immense amount of bank reserves. And it sounds like, oh my God, look at all this money printing. It's massive amounts of money printing. And yet, as we've talked about before, inflation in Europe is now negative again. Uh, the core inflation rate is the lowest it's been on record. There's no evidence that this money printing stuff is actually money printing because it's not what central bankers tell you they're doing or tell you how they're doing. It's what actually happens. That Where is the data? Where is the data that says this stuff actually works? That's right. The core inflation rate was reported to be 0.2% year over year, but not just in November. It was also the case in October and September. And as you mentioned, that's the record low, at least for this data set that only goes back to 1997. But for some context, the previous pre-corona low was 0 0.6. So we're at one third, despite so much more money printing, which suggests that should then translate to inflation. Jeff, would the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, agree with you that the ECB and the Fed and the other central banks will not return the economy to health? Yeah, I think, well, again, they're going to say, they're going to say it a little differently, right? They're not going to say that the Fed or the ECB or the Bank of Japan or People's Bank of China aren't being effective. What they're saying is they're being very effective, but that won't matter. <laughs> didn't like, look are we like splitting it. hairs here? Yeah, well, they put out a chart that we're going to talk about it. It doesn't yeah, what seem they, like they're being effective. Again, their models, their data says that monetary policy and fiscal, especially in combination with fiscal policy, radical fiscal spending and fiscal aid, these things are really good things and they're really effective. But yet, what we see is that economies are not recovering, at least in you know the, the ter using the term recovery as it's supposed to be, which means, as we started out before, a recession is a temporary deviation. When it's over with, you get a recovery that puts you back where you would have been had the recession never happened. That's not what we're seeing now, just like it's not what we saw after 2008. We have an economic dislocation, a permanent shock, you know, unit roots, those things we don't allow in econometrics. We see a permanent shock, and what the OECD is saying is that, yeah, there's a permanent shock here, and that global output is going to remain less than its prior trend for years and years and years, maybe ever. We may never get back to trend, but data driven in the economics, in the, in the sense of economics and econometrics, they're saying, well, the ECB must have been tremendously helpful. It's not their fault. They're saving jobs. So in other words, it would have been even worse if we hadn't had all of this quote unquote stimulus. So monetary policy's effectiveness is judged by the fact that, or the counterfactual that you can't prove that it must have been worse if they hadn't have done anything. Here's a quote from their most recent, I believe it's the economic outlook. Quote, output is projected to remain around 5% below crisis expectations in many countries in 2022, raising the specter of substantial permanent costs from the pandemic. They use the word scarring. I believe their head economist used it in one of, in his uh, quote regarding the, uh, the report. And so, but then they also, you know what they do, Jeff? They provide kind of uh, three scenarios, uh, the baseline, and then a good scenario, and then a bad scenario. I think the bad scenario was uh, if there isn't any fiscal relief, that it'll be even worse than the 5% off trend. But if it is, if everything goes well, we still never reacquire that pre-existing trend. And at the same time, they're saying this report is one of hope. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really, you know, when I first saw this, uh, this, uh, this publication, it really kind of made me mad. I mean, it made me really mad because you're right. The cover, the cover image and then the cover, the cover uh, title was coronavirus hope for, uh, what was it? Hope for reality or hope, reality from hope or whatever it was. Let me look it up here. I mean, it was just um, turning hope into reality. And then underneath in this report was, as you pointed out, uh, the data set which said, look, this, this global economy is not going to recover ever. I mean, we're talking about into the middle 2022s, which is beyond the view of most econometric models. And so as far as they're concerned, even the upside scenario where everything goes good, we might be only about three or two and a half to three percent behind trend, the prior 2019 trend, as opposed to five percent in their baseline case. Or if things start to go wrong again, which they what wrong in their in their view is lack of stimulus then we might be somewhere around 8%. And we're talking about global economic output. So this is a worldwide massive problem. And really, you know, I want to read the quote from the, what the economist said, which was, I mean, I think I thought it, he put it better than I could have put it. Um, because, you know, what he was really saying is that, look, there are, there are massive consequences to this. You can't just erase that. I mean, 2.5% or 3%, 5% doesn't sound like a big deal. But that's great recession levels of of contraction. That's really bad stuff. Five percent of a global economy is going to cause all sorts of problems. So here's what their chief economist said: Despite the huge policy band aid, which is again job saved, this the stimulus stuff made it kept it from being even worse. Even in an upside scenario, the pandemic will have damaged the socioeconomic fabric of countries worldwide. Output is projected to remain around five percent below pre crisis expectations, as you said you know, raising the specter of permanent cost. And here's the most important part. The most vulnerable will continue to suffer disproportionately. Smaller firms and entrepreneurs are more likely to go out of business. Many low wage earners have lost their jobs and are only only covered by unemployment insurance at best with poor prospects of finding new jobs soon. Now that describes a recession, but it doesn't describe, I mean, that's what happens in a recession but can you imagine a recession that doesn't end? All of those factors that we normally see in a recession that goes on year after year after year after year, well, we, we already can manage, imagine that because we've experienced that over the last 12 years. And now along comes this new coronavirus or COVID or what they're calling a COVID recession. And it's now going to be on top of the old one, even more uh, destruction in the social fabric. I mean, and then to put that out under the, you know, turning hope into reality. I mean, it's just, unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. And, and again, it's misleading and, and uh, purposely so. And that's why you quoted Orwell at the end. I think most people know the Orwell quote from Animal Farm that all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others, courtesy of the pigs who are now in charge of the government. The quote you took from Orwell, do you, do you have it handy there? If not, I can read it out. No, you go ahead and read it. That's fine. Political language is, quote, is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. And so that title, the pure wind, but underneath, uh, completely the opposite. This is political language. It's all of it. Everything we've been talking about so far in this episode, going back to Janet Yellen talking about, oh, I had 10 million jobs created in my tenure. Political language. It's it's technically true, but as, as Orwell said in the end of this quote, it's to give the appearance of solidity to pure wind. It's meaningless garbage. It's how do we hide the fact that things are really bad? And here in the OECD, Christine Lagarde, Europe, inflation, all this money printing, it, turning hope into reality. This is really bad stuff. I mean, this is low wage earners going to be affected for for the foreseeable future with no prospects for job for for any job. I mean. When in history has that ever turned out really good? Where's the positive, where's the hope in all of that? The hope they're talking about is that if, if governments spend and central banks print money, it won't be worse. That's not hope. That's, not, that's, that's what Orwell said. That's political language that's, that's purposely designed to mislead. There might be hope in something new, modern monetary theory. And in part three, Jeff is going to respond to a recent appearance of Stephanie Kelton on Macro Voices, but then just more generally the idea of 
modern monetary theory and what Stephanie Kelton has written, is this something that can give hope, something new that we're adding to the monetary recipe book? 